All right, this is the follow up and we are following up on a live video I did a couple months ago that uh, focused on my preparation uh, for the show Into Proud, The Life and Times of the Temptations. My guest today is the great Shelley Berger, who has a distinguished job, position, honor to be the manager of the Temptations, the one manager of the Temptations almost from the beginning, I would say, or from the beginning, I believe. So, uh, Shelley, welcome to the, to the follow-up, and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me here. Of course, my pleasure. Um, without any further ado, let's get into it. Let me tell the audience that's watching and that's listening um, how we met and, and why I thought your perspective would be so valuable today um, on, on the follow-up. Uh, it was 2017, March of 2017, I got called in to do a workshop, um, the workshop for the show Ain't Too Proud. Um, and in the context of that workshop, Shelley Berger was kind enough to give us a, a talk about how things went down back in the day uh, at Motown. Uh, and needless to say, his perspective, Shelley, your perspective, and I need to explain this to the audience, um, is totally unique and, and totally your own since you were there at the moment of, of when all this great music was recorded, when it all kind of went down. Um, that talk that Shelley held back then, uh, and it, I think it's, it's fair to say, and I'm, it's, this is not hyperbole or anything like that, changed the... The, the approach that the cast and perhaps also the band took to um, representing the characters of the show. Because with his words, with his uh, stories, Shelley Berger was able to basically bring everything into real life, bring everything into, into the contemporary, even though it happened perhaps 30, perhaps 40 years ago. Um, all of a sudden, cast members who were who are way younger than, than I am, um, understood, and this is my, including, including myself, understood that this is not just a show with uh, characters that are being played on a stage. This is somebody's life. This is somebody's, you know, history, experience, ups and downs. These are characters that um, we all know because we all have them in our families, um, yet what these particular people, characters, types did um, transcended all over the globe. Um, so my, my hope today is basically to follow up on that talk and sort of give the audience um, part of your perspective because I do understand that, you know, there's a lot that you have seen, a lot that you have experienced. Um, so how was it back in the day? Well, uh, and I'd like to start by saying, um, I have always said talent, that timing beats talent. Yes. Any time of the day. Yes. And how I got to Motown, I was managing a bunch of artists and uh, actors, and I was going to a meeting at the William Morris Agency for one of my artists, Dick and Dee Dee. Mm. And um, as I'm walking through the door, the agent that I'm meeting with is on the phone and he says, I would not be interested, but you know who would be great? Would be Shelley Berger. Oh, wow. And I walked through the door and I said, what, what was that all about? Now you understand, this agent and I were, were friendly, uh, just on a business level. I mean, we, we weren't social. Right. Friends. And I said, what was that all about? And he said, did you ever hear of Motown? Mm. I said, yeah. <laughs> I said, they're, in, they're incredible. But understand, this was 1965. Right. Motown to the outer world in 65 had a number of hit records. Right. But it wasn't the world renowned Motown. Right. Right. As we know it, as we know it to uh, today, what it was thought of was it's an R&B company, right? Because right. they had mostly 
black artists. And um, unfortunately, the way America is is set up, yeah. oh, if you have black artists, then you're an R and B you know, company. You obviously cannot be a full service record company. Right. Right. So. I said, yeah, I mean, I would be very interested because they needed someone to open their California office. Mm, okay. And I was then co contacted by Ralph Seltzer, who was Motown's in-house attorney. Yeah. And we started conversations. That was in late 65. And we didn't get together until 1966. Oh, wow. And I started with, with Motown in June of 1966. Mm. And I have to say whether I'm a good luck charm or whatever, <laughs> as soon as I joined Motown, everything started to explode. Nice. <laughs> we, we were all of a sudden we were getting a smash every 90 seconds. Mm. And it was, un, it was unreal. I mean, no record company. I mean, this was the time where it was the English invasion. Right, right. And Motown. Right, right. I that mean, was, it, that was, was the, it, yeah. it was incredible. It yeah. was incredible. Yeah. And so I had never met Barry Gordy before I had taken this job. Unbelievable. And every time I said, well, where's Mr. Gordy? Right. Well, he's out, he's out on the road, he's out here. And I started to say, is this a cult? <laughs> I mean, where you have this, uh, you know, character who nobody ever sees. <laughs> yeah. It's the Wizard of Oz, you right, know. Right. And right. Um, I said, no, no, he's a he's a very real person. And um, someone said to me one one morning, "Well, you understand if you take the R and Y out of his name, you know what's left." <laughs> I said, "Oh, okay." Okay. Uh, I, I'll go along with that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it was July 4th that um, I had been introduced to Mr. Gordy's former, one of Mr. Gordy's former wives. Right. And she invited me out to a picnic. Mm. And I had this incredible time at the picnic. And I thought I was going to be a big star. Wow. And uh, the following Monday... I, you see, Motown at that time had a bunch of buildings right. on West Grand Boulevard. Yeah, yeah. So when they wanted people, they had a loudspeaker system. Oh, wow. Across this boulevard. And it was a uh, Shelly Berger, please come to the Mr. Gordy's office. Oh, okay. And then you went to that house oh, where wow. his office was. That's incredible. That's and incredible. the greatest thing was Studio A. Yeah was right next door to a funeral home. Oh, yes. And I was at a Holland O'Jahalan track session right. one morning. And you know the tracks that Holland O'Jahalan would put down. And I went bopping out there and almost fell over a coffin because <laughs> there was a funeral going on right next door. <laughs> and they were bringing the casket out. Multi but that, that, was, that was the excitement. Right. Of right. Motown. Right. You have to understand that this was a bunch of young people. Right. Some teenagers. Yeah. And in their young, you know, their early 20s. Right. Who were at Motown. If they weren't on the road or they weren't in the studio, they were hanging out at Studio A. Right. It was right. a social club. It was, it was a, it was not a record company, no one understood it, but it was an entertainment company. Right, right, right. But they were just having the time of their life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was clearly like a, a strong family unit, a strong sort of Total. community that just, yeah. Look, uh, they, would, they would sit around in the hallway of, 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 of the building that had Studio A. Yeah. And from time to time, some producer would come walking out. Hey, I need some people for hand claps. So it could be the Temptations. It could be Diana Ross. Right. And, you know, I need someone to do wah-wahs. Right. You know, and everybody would run to do that because you got $50. 
Of course. If you were on that, if, if you were on that record, you got fifty dollars, and you know that was a big thing in nineteen sixty six. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, I met with Mr. Gordy, and as I said later on, I didn't know that when you were summoned by Mr. Gordy in nineteen sixty six, that you had to be deathly afraid. <laughs> And I just went up to his office and he asked me what what my background was. And I right. told him what my background was. And he said, do you think you can get our artists on television? Mm. Mm. And I said, Mr. Gordy, not only will we get our artists on television, right. but one day we will do our own specials. I'll check that out. One day we will do our own movies, mm. and one day they will do a documentary mm. on Motown. This is like July 6th of 1966. He immediately excused me from the meeting, mm. called up Ralph Seltzer, mm. and said, fire this guy. And Ralph said, why? He said, either he's on drugs, <laughs> or he's the biggest liar I ever heard in my life. Incredible, incredible. And Ralph Seltzer said, okay, I will fire him. But you understand he has set up this television show on Thursday mm. and it, it, it's a whole hour mm. of the show where the action is just on Motown. And Mr. Gordy said, okay, don't fire him yet. Yeah. But I'll let you know. Yeah, let's see how this goes and, and yes. then we'll figure it out. Yeah. Yes, okay. So, television show was a huge success. And what Mr. Gordy wanted from me was he had a, we had a white artist mm -hmm. by the name of Chris Clark. Yeah. Who uh, Mr. Gordy was uh, the mentor for. Right. And I got a call and said, uh, Mr. Gordy wants Chris Clark on the show. Mm. Now you understand on that show was the Temptations, the Four Tops, Marvin Gaye, Tammy Terrell, Stevie Wonder, yeah. the Marvelettes. And this I mean, is 1966. everybody but the Supremes were on that show. Right, right, right. Okay. Right. Now the show is finished and we are now going to get Chris Clark right. on the show. Mm. And as she is blocking, they are blocking her. Right. I see Mr. Gordy walking back and forth in just the body language. Yeah. And I walked up to him and I said, Mr. Gordy, is there a problem? Right. And he said, well, how are they going to shoot her? Mm. And I said, I'll tell you what, the producer is a good friend of mine. I will bring him over here and you can tell him what That's he wants. Good. I went out to the producer, Jerry Goldstein, and I said, look, I just got this job. And, you know, Mr. Gordy is really concerned about this because she's a white artist and this is very important to us branching right. out. Right. He walked up to him and said, Mr. Gordy, what is it that you want? I'll tell you what, Mr. Gordy, why don't you go into the truck Right. and sit with the director and you tell him exactly what you want. Wow. And he looked at Jerry Goldstein and he looked at me and he's like, what is going on with this guy? Yeah, and you made okay, that so possible. I mean, let's, that's Let's incredible. not fire him yet. So he right. called Ralph Seltzer again. Eh, let's not fire him yet. <laughs> so now I get a telephone call one day. Um, Mr. Gordy is in Las Vegas with the Supremes, mm. and he wants you to come up to Las Vegas and meet with him. And I said, okay. And I went and, and, and I met with him, and he was on the phone with the Supremes agent. Right. And he said, do you know Norman Weiss? And I said, yes, I know Norman Weiss. He said, well, he's on the phone with me now, and there's a date for the Supremes, for $25,000 for a week. Now you have to understand in 1966, $25,000 is a little different. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a lot of money. Top of the 
top of the line money. Right. And he said, but I have to give him an answer right now. What should I say? Mm. I said, if you have to give him an answer right now, you tell him the answer is no, mm. that he doesn't want the Supremes, he wants some other act. If you have to be forced into telling him today, right. he doesn't want the Supremes. Right. So again, Mr. Gordy is like looking at me, who is this guy? Mm. But gets on the phone and says, Norman, if I have to give you an answer now, the answer is no. Right. And all of a sudden, Norman Weiss says, oh, listen, if, if, if you can't give me an answer, that's OK. If you can let me know oh, wow. when I can get an answer right. and, uh, you know, I will wait for you. Mm. And all of a sudden, a light went on in Barry Gordy's mm -hmm. head like, oh, really? Mm. So now I spent what was supposed to be a meeting. Right. I spent two weeks in Las Vegas wow. with Barry Gordy and probably one of the two greatest weeks of my life. <laughs> oh, and yes. the love affair, the love <laughs> affair started. Right. right. At the end of the two weeks, he said to me, look, I manage the Supremes and my sister manages the Temptations. Yeah. Now you manage the Supremes and you manage the Temptations. Oh, wow. And all of a sudden, my management career at Motown started. Yeah. So you had double duty for, for a long time, I would, I would imagine, doing the Supremes as well as the Temptations. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, wow. I, um, I was with the Supremes and then with Diana mm -hmm. um, until 1978, mm. 1979. Incredible. Incredible. And with the temps off and on, you know, um, since 1966. That is incredible. So that's about 55 years in all. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. as you know, it is 2021 is the 60th anniversary. Yes. Of the Temptations, which we will be kicking off Juneteenth, will uh, Black Music Month. Right. is when the anniversary will start. We're having a new piece of product out. Mm. And um, there will be all things related oh. to to the, the Temptations. And hopefully with this vaccine and everything, yes, maybe we go back on Broadway. Yeah, and I mean. That, and the national tour starts. Of course, wouldn't but that that's be? That's getting away from, from the subject matter of what was Motown like in 1966, I always refer to it as it was a 1950s MGM musical. Oh. My uncle has a barn. Let's put on a show. <laughs> Whatever Barry Gordy asked for. Right. No one ever, including myself, never questioned it. Of course. Of course. Okay, you want to do that? We'll do it. Right. And it got done. Right. Right. It was, it was absolutely amazing. Yeah. And I will get away from this story for one moment. Yeah, yeah, please. It was now, what, 2000, the White House right. was doing a night of Motown. Right. Barack Obama yeah. was the president. Yeah. And we were all there and we were hosted by the President Barack Obama and Michelle Obama. Yeah, first lady. And they yeah. were doing a night of Motown. Right. And I said, if you remember, mm. in 1966, when I said we would do our own television specials, we would do our own movies, and we would have a documentary of Motown, I never expected that would be we'd be invited to the <laughs> White House, and you were going to fire me. <laughs> no, I was never going to. I said, you are full of crap. <laughs> you are full of crap. <laughs> <That's> but a... <laughs> it is, That's it is very, it's very, very hard to, to capture mm. the excitement yeah. of these young people who right. all came from working class families right. in a racist country right. 
and they were trying to break through right. to the world. Yeah. And because of the talent and because of the Funk Brothers, if you will, yes, because yes. of James Jamerson, because the bottom line was Benny Benjamin and James Jamerson right. were the backbone. They were that was it. The yeah. balls. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, I told totally... that 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 you started to feel when you heard yeah. that bass. Yeah, when yeah. you heard those drums, it just grabbed you. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Not that all the rest of the guys weren't. No. Know, the, like and everybody, what, what wasn't great, but yeah, yeah. but those two guys. Right. Right. And um, James was such a. He knew music so well. Yeah. Because let's face it, up until Motown, James was a jazz yeah. bassist. Yeah. He and played he, the upright. And he was upright successful. Bass, yeah, you know, and yeah. you know, in in talking with BG through the years, he mm. would say I would have so much trouble with these guys because they would all of a sudden start going to jazz riffs. Mm. Of course, yeah. and I would have to say, man, we're not doing jazz; we're doing, and uh, but but the talent was there, mounds and mounds and mounds of talent, mm. but you had. The key was Barry Gordy. Yeah. He yeah. made it all work. Yeah. He created a sense in everybody, we can do this. Right. We can do this. Right. right. In 1968, a television special. Unheard of. Yeah. The Supremes and the Temptations. Yeah. A national television special on NBC. Yeah. With two pop black groups. Just two pop black groups doing all the comedy, all the choreography, all the singing on the sketches. Number one show, Emmy Award winning show. Incredible. A year later, GIT on Broadway, number mm. one show, Emmy mm. Award winning show. Mm. I mean, that's what we brought to the table. Yeah. And the fighting that we had to do with television. Yeah was everybody would say, look, man, we're not cutting a record here. It's a mm. TV show. And as far as Barry Gordy was concerned, BS. Yeah. I want you to do it the way and we fought and we got it to the point where four and five years later, every television show was doing what we had to fight to yeah. get in 1966. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So the innovations that the innovations that Motown brought to the television industry. Yeah, there's no no the, end to, to it. The, to the variety business. It's it's very much that that particular point is very much the same as as with the music. You know, I mean, there was not a label back then. Of course, I wasn't even born back then, but there was not a label that I can think of that did anything else. That, that didn't take its cues from Motown. Let me put it this way. There might have been, you know, labels that said, okay, Motown is doing this over here, so we are going to go the other direction. But that in in its own way is also taking cues from Motown, like it's also following the lead. And then the other labels, the other artists, be it the Beatles, you know, all the British invasion artists or whatever, they all took their cues from Motown. So it's, it's, it's very on, much it's the same. the Beatles' first album. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay, there are three Motown, three Joe Bet songs mm. on the Beatles' first album. Right, right. The Beatles idolized yeah. Motown. I was in I was in Smokey Robinson's dressing room one night at a club called the Roxy mm. in LA, and someone came in and said, George Harrison mm. is backstage and he would like to come in and say hello. Wow. And Smokey said, hey, man, sure. Yeah. George Harrison of the Beatles right. walks into the room and falls to his knees and kisses Smokey's hand and starts to cry. Wow. And said, do you have any idea what you meant mm. to, to us? Do you have any idea what you brought into the life mm. of John and George and Ringo and myself? Right, right, right. That's the feeling. Right. 
right. that these English acts had Motown right. was right. their ground zero. Unbelievable. I mean, um, it's not unbelievable. It's totally believable. It's because you hear it. You hear but that, it. But that is, and then we come back mm. to James Jameson and Benny Benjamin and yeah. to the Funk Brothers. Yeah, 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 yeah. This, it's, you know it's, what I mean? It wasn't, yeah. well, who was on this record and who was on this? They were on every record. Right, right, right. It was unbelievable. Yeah. It was unbelievable that you had this nucleus. Right, right. That 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 in and of itself is is totally unique. Like that that is something. And perhaps you know, if uh, credit where credit is due, I mean, Jameson was a genius, no doubt about it. Uh, Benny Benjamin was a genius, no doubt about it. Barry Gordy is a genius for being able to find these. He could, he could corral. He could corral them all. Yeah. To find them, find them all, and just be in it, and 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 put them all together, and make them into a unit, so to speak, you know. Or exactly, exactly. I mean that that in and of itself is is incredible talent. It needs to be acknowledged, you know. I mean, well, that that's that's why I I I I never feel that Barry Gordy gets his just due. Mm. There, there are no accolades right. that Barry Gordy can get in this world mm. that that he is not deserving of. Right. right. For what he did in America. Right. Right. And you have to understand what was going on in 1966 mm. is going on in 2020. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the same kind of... stuff we were going through in '60 in our play. Mm, mm, the scene mm. when they're talking about the riots in Detroit. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. guess what? We got they're riots here. now too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so um, it seems like these things don't change. They may right. get they may get appreciably better. Right. But they don't they they, they don't train change and hopefully ain't too proud as it gets wider and wider and the national companies go out yeah the the world will get the feeling yes yes of yeah. what of what Motown because ain't too proud is about something that happened 60 years ago yeah and it is as contemporary as today anything. as it yeah. was in 1966 yeah yeah i totally agree i think that 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 a lot of a lot of of um information a lot of um not only analytical or intellectual information but you know also and perhaps important most importantly emotional in information is being conveyed as the show as the show plays out right and it's, it's it's being conveyed in in conversations like what we're having right now you know i mean this is going out you know into the internet and to youtube and whatnot people are going to see this so people are going to hear this and and will be able to perhaps get a uh, um a different viewpoint a different point of view right a different you know vantage point that tells them okay wait a second this you know that there is no point in repeating what has already happened. Hopefully, hopefully we will we will get we will get to that point. Yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah. know, um, and I believe that ain't too proud, and the history of Motown right will help. Yeah, along along those lines. But I have to tell you that, you know, I was thinking about it before, you know, since I, I wasn't that involved with, with, the, with the staff musicians. Right, right. Uh, but James, Diana Ross mm. had heard that, that James was not doing well right. medically. Right. And of course, at this point in time, Motown had moved. Was already in Los Angeles and all that. Yes. Yeah. So, um, she came to me one day and she said, look, I would like to hire Jameson right. to come out on tour with us. Mm. I, I just feel in my heart right. he meant so much 
to her to to me right to the girls yeah to the guys yeah you know i i want to do that i said okay fine and i called james and we made we made a deal and he came out on the road with us mm -hmm. and was with us for for a few months yeah but he was he was pretty ill right and right. you know and touring under the best circumstances is is a lot is pretty rough yeah 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 and um and it, it wasn't much after that tour that james had passed had passed right, passed right. on uh but i but mean that, that was with diana you know that you know people say things about diana ross i mean she's mm. a great punching bag mm. for for many people but mm. i no, Diana Ross lived with Diana Ross, right. you know, for right. 13 years. And right. um, it was things like this, right? how she felt about James, how she felt about Motown. No, I mean, that is huge. About all, all those, all those people. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, no one will ever know that if I don't tell you that story today, of no course. one would ever know that story of course no that is that is huge that's that's really big because it does speak to um an awareness right that um, Absolutely. was Absolutely. so prevalent not only with the musicians they knew what they were doing and, and i've been kind of talking about that you know a lot and with people and with other musicians and whatnot like whatever you hear on a motown track be it from jameson or whoever is there for a reason it, it it's Absolutely. not it did not happen accidentally there might have been like happy accidents uh, i spoke with with Otis williams yesterday and you know he said the beginning of of my girl you know what uh, right. like that happy accident great you know but for the most part this was all done on purpose and it seemed to me that from that story from the diana ross story and and her closeness to jameson and her wish to have him on the road with her um yeah. It seems to me that that everyone, artists, you know, staff, management included, kind of understood that what is happening here is very special, right? And these this group of musicians is very special, and and they are doing something. They are doing the best that they can, and and perhaps that influences now us to do the best that we can, and you know, and therefore it keeps going sort of in a circle where it's self reciprocating um in terms, yeah in in terms of quality you know but you understand when we were doing this right no one thought what we are doing is special check that out this is what this is what was in our hearts right right and uh and barry gordy once again yeah was the driving force that would would take you to places mm. would allow you he gave you the room to reach heights that you might have never thought that you could reach. Incredible, incredible, incredible. Well, that's, I mean, that's, if, if that is incredible. So that, that, that floors me, you know, that's, and, and that is very much um, the same sort of feeling that, that I had, you know, in 2017, after the talk that you, that you gave to us and, and kind of where you explained how things happened back in the day with the temptations with the various contracts with tv promotions with um, you know getting them on tv how difficult that is and at the same time having like the backbone of the band just churning out the hits and making sure that at least from the musical or from the instrumental part side um, everything was taken care of like all you need to do is do your part on top of this but we got this like we have we meaning the musicians we got this. We we're, we're gonna give you a top-notch quality product. Absolutely. I need you to you know you need to do top-notch quality on top of that. So Absolutely. that's you know that's that's just incredible. And and for all these years and all these generations of musicians, like uh, I need you to understand that this and not that you don't know that, but there is it is difficult to 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 define quality, right? It's difficult to say that certain aspects are what defines quality quality is sort of this 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 entity that kind of changes depending on what you talk about it, it's subjective but can i tell you something yeah 
good is good. Good is of course. I mean, Duke Ellington says, "Whatever sounds good is good." There's, That's right. Know, there you go. That's so right. it was. But what you guys did has become the definition of quality. You know, and that that is something that we live up to, right? That is something that you know. I know. I know. I'm, I can speak for myself, but I, I'm pretty sure I can speak for the Into Proud band. That is kind of the high watermark that we're trying to achieve. You know? I think you can speak for the for the entire company. Yes, of course. Everybody, everybody, oh, yeah. you know, from from the the stage hands yeah, yeah. on up. I right. mean, um, has given of their heart. I, yeah. I truly believe, as you said earlier on, this became more than another gig, yeah. another That's play, yeah. another musical. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It, it took on its own, its own life. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And I'll tell you how good it was. I was also very involved with the Motown the musical that Barry Gordy wrote. Of course. And when Ira Pittleman and, and Tom Hulse were, were constantly saying to me, when is Barry Gordy going to see the show? Right. When is Barry Gordy going? And I made arrangements for him to come to Berkeley. Right. It was one of the last, I think it was the last night in Berkeley. Yeah, I remember he that, came. That, yeah. that he came up there. And it, at the end of the first act, he grabbed me and he said, I have never been so proud of you mm. in our entire career oh, wow. together. This mm. is so brilliant mm. on every level. Mm. And if you remember, he came on stage afterwards and yeah. was like taking pictures for an hour. Yeah, 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 yeah. He even he was, took a picture with so, the band. Yeah. He was so he was so into it. Yeah, yeah. And finally said to me after an hour, "I haven't done this for my own play. Why am I doing this for your play?" <laughs> I said, "Because it comes out of you." Yeah, yeah. All of, of it comes out of you. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, listen, Shelley, I, I, I cannot thank you enough. I, I, I don't want to keep you any longer. Uh, I really appreciate all the time, you know, and, and, and your availability and all the stories and, and your perspective and the fact that you're willing to share that perspective with me and with the audience. It, it means the world. I cannot me. thank you enough. Oh, please. For giving me some kind of platform. Of course. To, to, to share. Mm this very, very special thing in my life. Yeah. yeah Thank yeah, you, yeah. George. Oh, of course, Shelley. So I am so, I'm, I'm very, very, very grateful. So thank you. Thank you again. Um, stay safe out there, you know, stay sane out there. Um, and hopefully, you know, in a couple months, however, however long we'll, it takes. We will, be able, we will be able to do what we do. Exactly. All right. Take care, Shelley. Okay, George. Take care.